The story of the railways began a century and a half ago. In no time at all, steam had conquered the world. Those days will never be forgotten. Everyone called the locomotive the Iron Horse. Steam was alive and kicking. builders were citizens of the world. As their inventions took shape, mercifully they could never have foreseen the end. Their creations seemed everlasting symbols of power. Great locomotives became famous as the heroes of myth and legend and were so named. King Arthur, Nelson, Columbine, the Flying Scot. Now they are becoming a legend themselves. As the age of steam passes, its tumultuous vision fades. changed the face of England, we became bound together in a web of iron which held us in its grip for a hundred years. Britain's railways were built by giants, Richard Trevithick, engine maker and pioneer before his time. George Stevenson, a cowherd's son who first repaired boots and mended clocks and then built the first railway in the world. His son, Robert Stevenson, the architect of our first main lines and of many of the engines on them. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, engineer and visionary who gave his life to forging a railway west from London. And George Hudson, the king of speculators, whose schemes, half sense, half fantasy, ruined thousands who shared his lust for railway gold. The story of steam is the story of men like these. Their inventions and their will helped Britain to master the Industrial Revolution. But it was a mastery achieved by passion as well as by power. We made our engines pretty and stylish things, dressed in feminine clothes. But if the locomotive was the mistress of power, the railways themselves were masculine. In an imperial age, no one thought it strange to embellish a station with an image of a pagan god. The railways expressed the spirit of their time. A painter, John Martin, who knew George Stevenson as a boy, expressed the same mood even before railways began. 
what he saw in imagination, the railways soon provided in reality. They broke like a thunderstorm over an England which had changed little since the days of Shakespeare. The railways began with coal, which used to be carried in chaldron wagons hauled by man or horse to the nearest rivers and the sea. After the invention of the stationary steam engine, steam was put on wheels and the first locomotives appeared around the pits and mines. Yet few people understood what was happening and when in 1808 Trevithick built a circular railway behind a fence close to where Euston Station is, no one thought much about it. But meanwhile, the north of England had become an industrial centre. By the second half of the 18th century, the country round Newcastle was thriving on its coal, wagonways and access to the sea. The railways were made in provincial England and left their mark there. As early as 1726, a local mason in County Durham built one of the world's finest dry stone bridges to carry a wagonway from a nearby mine. His arch spanned a hundred feet and still stands as proudly as any cathedral. On the Northumbrian coast, along the Tyne and Tees, they built massive wooden platforms called staiths, which stood high above the ships. From these, the coal poured directly from the wagons to the ships below. These staiths are still built on the same coast, and the old children wagons, which were invented before steam existed, are still in use here and there. Primitive coffee pot engines shunted wagons until only a few years ago, and not very far from where Stevenson's Stockton to Darlington Railway began. Steam was built to last, and so it did. It has clung tenaciously to some of the oldest railways in Britain. Powerful locomotives still work in the hills of Northumberland and Durham, climbing a thousand feet from the sea to the steelworks. The railways developed so rapidly, within a few years of their birth, they got to the highest points they ever reached. Within 20 years, they had transformed the whole of England. The railway revolution was the work of a few great men. George Stevenson was born in a cottage near the village of Wylam, 14 miles from Newcastle. But by 1813, two pioneers, William Headley and Timothy Hackworth, had developed the locomotive into a machine with a practical use. Hackworth also lived at Wylam, and the Wylam Dilly and the Puffing Billy became the first locomotives to achieve fame. Seeing machines such as these, George Stevenson was the first young boy to want to be an engine driver. Soon he was building engines for the mines. Stevenson took the locomotive as he found it, and with the latest skills developed by smithies and foundrymen, made the thing work better. He built this locomotive for a colliery in 1822. It was still working in 1912. But at the time, there was nothing one could yet call a railway. I will do something in the course of time, Stevenson said, which will astonish all England. There is little in the black country west of Darlington to suggest the great events that followed, a few crumbling bridges and embankments, some square stones which were used for railway sleepers, a line of houses on a ridge with an arch in the wall where a winding engine house used to be a few railway cottages, and beyond, a stone shed like a chapel where locomotives were built for Stevenson's famous Stockton-Darlington line. The railway was, to its shareholders, just a business proposition. They wanted a cheap way to carry coal. What they got was a revolution. It was Stevenson's great chance to prove what his mechanical horse could do. The Stevensons, father, son, and three brothers, drove their line through all opposition. When the first train set out towards Darlington, 400 persons somehow got aboard amongst the directors, the engineers, and the friends of the firm. 
Bearing its enthusiastic jumble of passengers and coal, Stevenson's locomotion lurched in triumph towards its goal. gathered from miles around to see the incredible come true. The crowds at Darlington had been gathering since daybreak. 10 or 12,000 people were said to be there. At 12 noon, and a little late, Stevenson and the locomotion steamed into Darlington. It was the 27th of September, 1825. Overnight, Darlington had become a railway town. George Stevenson was now a hero. Two great cities turned to him for aid. Liverpool with its trade to America and Manchester with its factories. The only hope was steam. They held a competition with a prize of 500 pounds for an improved locomotive which consumed less smoke and made more speed. There were five entries. The one horsepower Cyclopede, the Perseverance by Timothy Burstall, the Sands Parale by Timothy Hackworth, the Novelty by Braithwaite and Erickson, and the winner, The Rocket by George and Robert Stevenson. George Stevenson seized his new opportunity. It was his skill and persistence, and this alone, which found the ways and means to build the cuttings, tunnels, viaducts, and the 63 bridges which brought Liverpool and Manchester together. Stevenson defeated nature, driving his line over ground which would not even bear the weight of man and horse. He defeated the violent opposition of landowners, the canals and the stagecoachmen. He defeated superstition in an age when men believed that any movement over 10 miles an hour would crush the human body. Stevenson knew better and completed the line in four years. In September 1830, eight trains assembled at Liverpool with hundreds of passengers apiece. The first train carried the Duke of Wellington in a state coach that looked like a traveling Parthenon. The Duke had fought the railways tooth and nail because, as he said, they would encourage the lower classes to move about. I see no reason, he had declared, to suppose that these machines will ever force themselves into general use. The opening was used by the Tory party to bring about a reconciliation between Wellington and William Huskisson, Member of Parliament for Liverpool. But everything went wrong. Alighting from the train as it stopped for water, Huskisson approached the Duke in an attempt to heal the breach between them. But Rocket was on the other line. Huskisson was killed. It was a tragedy, a fiasco. But in spite of all this, the railway was an immediate success. Contrary to all expectations, the line made even more money from passengers than it did from freight. The actress Fanny Kemble was one of the first to taste its joys. She, for they make these curious little fire horses or mares, consisted of a boiler, a stove, a small platform, a bench, and behind the bench, a barrel containing enough water to prevent her being thirsty. She goes upon two wheels, which are her feet, and are moved by bright steel legs called pistons. 
These are propelled by steam, and in proportion as more steam is applied to the upper extremities, the hip joints, I suppose, of these pistons, the faster they move the wheels. The reins, the bit and the bridle of this wonderful beast is a small steel handle, which applies or withdraws the steam from its legs or pistons so that a child might manage it. This snorting little animal, which I felt rather inclined to pat, was then harnessed to a carriage, and Mr. Stevenson, having taken me upon a bench of the engine with him, we started. And now a word or two about the master of all these marvels, with whom I am most horribly in love. His face is fine, though careworn, and bears an expression of deep thoughtfulness. He has certainly turned my head. However inconvenient it may have been to some, the public fell in love with steam. The iron horse was king, and the faithful nags and dobbins of the horse-drawn days became the first victims of mechanization. Nothing could stop the railways now. It was Robert Stevenson's turn to achieve fame. His task was no less than to build Britain's first main line from Birmingham to London. Less robust than his father, his nature contained a streak of self-doubt which haunted him all his life, but he allowed nothing to stand in his way. He hired 20,000 men, he crossed canals, he cut through hills. The enterprise was likened to the building of the Great Wall of China or the pyramids. Robert Stevenson was no superman, but he calculated that quite apart from journeys by horse, he walked the entire distance from Birmingham to London 15 times before his work was done. Were it not for an almost unknown artist, John Cook Bourne, the son of a hatter, Stevenson's epic achievement would have gone unrecorded. Bourne's eye for detail, his gift for realizing the grand scale of what he saw, gave us an unforgettable record of the heroism of the early railway builders. In London, the upheaval began at Camden Town. To Charles Dickens, it seemed as though an earthquake had hit the town. Traces of its course, he wrote, were visible on every side. Houses were knocked down, streets broken through and stopped, deep pits and trenches dug in the ground, enormous heaps of earth and clay thrown up. Everywhere were bridges that led nowhere, thoroughfares that were wholly impassable. There were a hundred thousand shapes and substances of incompleteness, wildly mingled out of their places, upside down, burrowing in the earth aspiring in the air, mouldering in the water, and unintelligible as any dream. The great cutting at Tring was yet another example of nature disemboweled. The navvies refused to accept any methods which might have improved their safety, but cut their pay. Great barrows of earth were hauled up by precarious planks by ropes and pulleys worked by horses. If a horse stumbled or stopped, the barrow plunged backwards on top of the man who held its shafts. He had no choice but to leap clear or else be crushed. Everything about the first railways was ruthless and dangerous. Near Northampton, George Stevenson attempted to drive his line through a hill by means of a tunnel a mile and a half in length. Many feared that even if this could be done, the passengers would be choked to death by fumes or driven out of their senses by the noise and darkness within. It seemed impossible. The center of the hill was a mass of quicksand. Disaster faced Stevenson as contractor after contractor fell ill and threw up the job. The directors of the line panicked, but Stevenson was not to be stopped by a mountain. 1,200 men, 200 horses, and 13 pumping engines were thrown into the battle. In 19 months, the hill was sucked dry. The men who built the railways were as tough as their jobs. The aristocrats were the navvies. They were recruited from the highlands of Scotland, from Ireland and the sea walls of Norfolk. 
they had built Britain's harbors and canals. They consumed 16 to 18 pounds of beef a week. They drank white beer, a fiery liquid distilled in the tunnels, and they slept 10 at a time in huts of turf beside the line. People likened them to the mercenary armies that followed Napoleon over Europe. They used odd names like the Duke of Wellington, Catsmeat, Mary Ann, and Happy Jack. And these were the only names they would answer to. They were paid two shillings and sixpence a day. The line was opened in 1838. It was the end of feudal England. When the Cubitt brothers raised their arch at Houston, it was a tribute, modest in the circumstances, to the triumph of steam. The Houston Arch was by no means the only railway monument. Whilst Robert Stevenson was building his line to Birmingham, another, even greater work was on the move. Brunel's great broad gauge line to Bristol. He pointed it towards America, for to Brunel, the Great Western was just the first stage of the journey to New York. He was a man of extraordinary imagination, yet he had a complete mastery of the smallest practical detail. He completed his father's tunnel under the Thames. He built our first great iron steamships. He designed the Bristol Suspension Bridge. Technical adventure appealed to Brunel. His massive bridge across the River Tamar at Saltash was the most daring of all his works. It was said of him that he could make an engineering epic, but not a sonnet. His career was always the center of controversy, and few civil servants or bureaucrats would dare employ him now. He was the most vivid and flamboyant of all the apostles of steam, and it was characteristic of him that, sick and near the end of his life, he was drawn across his bridge on a truck on its opening day. Aristocratic, expensive, and endlessly daring, Brunel began the Great Western in 1835. His big-wheeled, broad-gauge engines pounded down the track at 60 miles an hour. It was often the fastest railway in the world. It cost six and a half million pounds and opened up the West in style.
By 1841, the line from London to Bath and Bristol was open all the way. Britain became a railway land. was the beginning of the end for rural England. In 1830, only a hundred miles of line were in public use. 25 years later, 9,000 miles had been built. With 80 million pounds already invested, 563 millions more were poured into schemes for the future. Soon the railways drew all Britain into their net. were planned so as to keep the works of man in harmony with nature. Though at the time many deplored their presence, in the end few could deny the poetry and the drama they brought to every corner of the land. great cities of Britain were being changed too. At Newcastle, where Robert Stevenson built locomotives for the world, his great iron bridge straddled the River Tyne like a giant. The railways were likened to a magician's wand. The locomotive, it was said, gave a new celerity to time. It virtually reduced England to a sixth of its size. It energized punctuality, discipline and attention and proved a moral teacher by influence of its example. Over the years, the railways became bright symbols of industry and labor. In the railway towns, they employed hundreds of thousands of men who formed in the structure of industrial Britain a nation within a nation. public relished the brave spirit of steam. The railways spared nothing to impress the world with their enterprise and power. They engineered a massive image which endured far beyond the Victorian age. Stone and metal was thrust into the air with all the assurance and not a few of the trappings of the castles and cathedrals of earlier days.
The dignified temples of steam did not inhibit the romance of travel. The Duke of Wellington had been wrong again. People loved the railways. Firmly rooted in the life of Britain, the railways expanded for a century and more. They heralded a golden age of travel. Alexander Anderson, poet and plate layer, got to the heart of it when he wrote, Hurrah for the mighty engine as he bounds along his track. Hurrah for the life that is in him and his breath so thick and black. And hurrah for our fellows who in their need could fashion a thing like him, with a heart of fire and a soul of steel and a Samson in every limb. But steam overreached itself. The world moved on, 
and steam paid little heed to change. In the kingdom of the railways, diesel and electric have usurped the throne. The glory of steam is played out, finished, gone. An engine driver's epitaph could well have been written in a graveyard such as this, at Darlington, where it all began. My engine now is cold and still. No water does my boiler fill. My coke affords its flame no more. My days of usefulness are o'er. My wheels deny their noted speed. No more my guiding hand they need. My whistle, it has lost its tone. Its shrill and thrilling sound is gone. My valves are now thrown open wide. My flanges all refuse to glide. No more I feel each urging breath. My steam is now condensed in death. Life's railway o'er, each station passed. At death I'm stopped and rest at last. They had pretty names, Jupiter and Jove, Columbine, John Bull, and the Lady of the Lake. What now of the illustrious names of George Stevenson, Robert Stevenson, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the men who made steam great? Were they still alive, they would not stop now. For to understand and to master change was their common goal. It was George Stevenson who started here at Darlington and said, I will do something in the coming time that will astonish all England. 